In healthcare especially, very, very important to understand sort of like the incentives of each player, how important being able to focus on a particular issue. It's like being an entrepreneur, it's like there's so many things that you feel you could address and solve. In our space especially, I think some people actually are concerned or might think that AI can replace humans completely, but I actually think that's a complete misconception. Hi everybody, welcome to the Deveco Breakfast Bar. Here we speak with different people involved in the business landscape, share their expertise, delve into the latest tech trends, and explore the ins and outs of IT outsourcing. I'm Oleg Sarikov, and today I'm excited to have Ferry Tamtero, CEO and co-founder at Revisto. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss new episodes. Hi Ferry, and thanks for joining me today. Thanks Alex for having me on the podcast here. Real excited. Let's start our podcast with a little blitz. I start a sentence and you continue, okay? Okay. Entrepreneurship gave me... There's really a chance to make a difference. Entrepreneurship deprived me... Of a lot of sleep, I guess. <laughs> My main superpower is... Be able to solve problems. My main weakness is... Not knowing when to stop. <laughs> when I'm afraid, I... I tend to think a lot. What inspired you to enter the healthcare tech industry? I actually graduated from college. I wanted to be in a big company, right? Just so happened that I actually got into a large medical device company, you know, GE Healthcare at the time. When I was in there, I actually honestly learned a lot. I took different roles from software to QA to project leads, all kinds of different roles, which is great. Then after a few years though, I actually almost decided to leave the healthcare industry because I actually felt like things were moving so slow. But then I got a chance to visit a hospital and then I got to a point where I actually see the products that I was helping build and how it's actually being used by people patients and by the healthcare providers. And that's just gives me a different feeling, right? That just gives you a feeling that, hey, you know what, what you're doing actually kind of matters, right? Like what you're helping, it actually matters. So that's kind of like the reason why I actually decided to stay in healthcare. And I guess throughout my experience, I also noticed a lot of areas where things are just being done manually in healthcare. Technology could definitely help a lot. That's where my passion between sort of like this intersection of healthcare and technology comes from is because there's just a lot that technology could be doing to improve healthcare, which then obviously improves the lives of all of us, I guess. I guess that's the main reason of founding Revisto. With Revisto, also, at some point in my career, I worked at, uh, at Amgen, which is a large biotech company. And one of my roles there was to launch digital health solutions for Amgen. So this would be things like a patient-facing app and clinician portal. And that was actually the first time when I actually heard of this process where multiple experts in the company, so this would be legal, regulatory, medical people, they have to go through this process where they have to review very carefully any material that is to be used externally, right? So this process is called the MLR review or the PRC process in some companies, right? But the process actually literally takes months, right? And it takes um, multiple iterations just to get a, a piece of marketing material out. And not only that, nobody is actually happy with actually working on that process because it's like, you know, you're reviewing it over and over again. That was the first time I ran into this kind of like opportunity, let's say, or issue in the, in the industry. And similarly, when I co-founded my last company called Bright Insight, we were also helping a life science company launch digital solutions. And again, similar pain point right, that we're seeing across multiple pharma. So when I saw that, and I also saw sort of like the state of where AI is currently, not just from a technology perspective, but really from a adoption perspective and people's acceptance, but like there was, you know, now is actually the right time to apply AI to solving this problem that is really causing, costing pharma companies, you know, upward like 10, $15 million per brand, like per drug that they have, it could be costing them 10 to $15 million because of this delays in the review process. Yeah. What are some of the most valuable lessons you have learned from your journey in the healthcare tech industry? So healthcare is one of those things, you know, especially in the US and a lot of extent outside of the US as well, is there's so many different players in the ecosystem, right? Like in the US, obviously you've got the pharma companies, you got the consumers, you've got the healthcare providers, you have the hospitals and insurance companies, right? And then the PBMs. So there's like just so many players. I think in healthcare especially, very, very important to understand sort of like the incentives, I guess, of each player. Because I think really knowing the incentives and not just about your product, not just how good or how advanced the technologies of your product, but really understanding how your product can be adopted in this environment where there's a lot of organizations that has all of their different incentives. Very, very important because it's not just about having the best technology, but it's about figuring out how those can actually be used by the actual end users. What is the best thing about being a founder multiple times? And what are some of the challenges you face that's specific to your particular experience and not something first-time founder would see? 
the lessons learned from I think my past companies have been focused. Literally, how important being able to focus on a particular issue is. Like being an entrepreneur, it's like there's so many things that you feel you could address and solve, right? Like you know, so sometimes it's actually more important to figure out. Okay, like let's just focus on what really we need to get done now, right? And actually do that really well. And how do you do that? Well, you get really, really deep understanding of the space and really deep understanding of the problem you're trying to solve, and then you just execute on that. The other thing is a lot of times you get a lot of advice, you get a lot of inputs that sometimes are conflicting as well. Being a founder and having experience in this area really helps with determining what might be more relevant, I guess, let's say, to a particular situation that you might be in, right? How do you balance the need for customization versus scalability in SaaS product? I think also, especially in B2B SaaS, this is this is right, like yeah, very prevalent. Let's say, first of all, I want to say there is a difference between configuration and customization. I do think products need configurability. Customization, I think in B2B, this is very tricky because especially as you're starting, there's a lot of requests from your customers, especially large customers, right? And the B2B world, like when you're starting, you're only working with probably a few of those large customers. And so you have to really pay close attention to what they're asking. I would say at the core, it's really under understanding what is it the problem that you're solving and how is that going to help your product if your product is really solving a real problem then sort of like the customization happens around the edges and that is okay actually and initially those let's call it customization that happens around the edges you could solve that by having probably like implementation for example right like implementation solutions or you could then optimize that implementation in a process or customer success process into your product by sort of like optimizing or automating a lot of the process and then over time as you see if more and more customers are asking for that, then you can sort of start to build that in the product. But truly understanding what is the problem that your product is solving so that you don't sort of like veer away and, and start to do a lot of too many customizations that kind of like derails the core of your product. AI can automate a lot, but what aspects of pharma marketing still require human expertise? In our space, especially, I think some people actually are concerned or might think that AI can replace humans completely, but I actually think that's a complete misconception because I think what really is powerful is sort of like this combination between AI and human. In our example, a lot of what our users have to do now is they have to manually review marketing materials, right? They have to figure out for every single statement that is being made on the marketing material, is there like an actual source that can back up that statement as an evidence? A lot of those work can actually be done by AI. A lot of that work can be automated. It can actually flag sort of like things that then the humans need to review. And examples would be making judgment calls. We really don't want to have AI, especially initially, making judgment calls in terms of the risk level that a company should be taking. So that really should be done by a human. That's where I see like, okay, AI can help with a lot of the sort of like lower level and repetitive work and things that are, let's just say, very tedious, right? But then the humans can come in and really make sure that they're applying sort of like that judgment, that subjective uh, interpretation, right? That, that needs to happen. A lot of healthcare and pharma companies are interested in AI but struggle with adoption. What advice would you give to leaders trying to integrate AI into their businesses? There's a tendency where they tend to want to solve big problems, right? But actually, my recommendation in AI is actually start small. The main reason for this is that when you're starting small, you can start to see progress. When you start to see progress, that will then become more and more projects and bigger and bigger projects. It's, it's sort of like counterintuitive, especially in the healthcare and the pharma world, because in a company, you might think that, oh, like if I'm starting small, there's not going to be a whole lot of impact. That also means that it's going to be very low in priority in an organization. But if you look at the flip side of it, right, like if you start big, that means there's like a huge risk in impacting a business. And in healthcare, generally, there's a lot of risk averseness um, in the company, right? Just given the space that they're in, like if you're in a pharma company, you're making a drug, right? Of course, it's very risky. If you're starting too big, then you could get into a space where you're actually not even going to be starting at all because you feel like it's too risky. I think a lot of leaders in pharma and healthcare companies really think about how to start small and how to look at the rate of improvements and not not just sort of like the actual final result, let's call it, but look at the rate of improvement when you're starting small. How do you see AI and automation playing a role in the context of healthcare? We've seen real examples of how AI is actually reviewing and providing sort of like early diagnosis from looking at radiology images like CT images or you know, X-ray images, right? You've seen AI help doctors take notes 
during a patient appointment, for example. All of those are great, right? Because that second example obviously gives the doctors a lot more time for actually interacting with the patient versus you know, figuring out how to take notes. And like what we're doing, we're, we're definitely helping automation a lot by automating sort of like the compliance of making sure that behind the scenes procedures of getting marketing materials out in market in a compliant manner is actually you know, compliant to regulations. Because there's a lot of uh, regulations in the US, a lot of regulations outside of the US. You have to keep track that those regulations are getting updated, for example, right? So understanding and keeping that up to date is definitely a prime example of where AI can really help. What key qualities do you look for when hiring talent for a high performing team? So we're a remote company, right? We're a distributed company. And with us, especially, especially important, right? Is like, how is this person going to fit well within our team in terms of proactiveness, in terms of communication? Being a distributed team, the clarity, I guess, in communication then leads to collaboration. And then the other thing is the space that we're in, even though the MLR space, right, the medical legal or regulatory space of promotional materials has been known for years, right, in the pharma industry, but the intersection between that and AI is very new. There will be surprises. And so the interest and sort of like the willingness to learn to sort of like really get deep understanding the domain and the problem that we're solving is extremely crucial for us. And the other thing is, I think maybe probably just in any startup, right? But being really passionate about the area that you're in, it could be about user experience. It could be about sort of like understanding natural language processing, or it could be about optimizing system performance, whatever that might be, you got to be passionate because I think working in a startup, if you don't have that passion, it's like, you're not going to be able to get up in the morning and sort of feel excited about, <laughs> about what you're doing, right? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Are there specific regions or countries that you find particularly promising for tech talent? I think the this whole shift now of being able to tap into sort of like a global talent pool is actually is amazing. It's great. Like, like for us, it's not about particular regions. We do have quite a number of team members that are in Eastern Europe. It's not like we're targeting that particular region, I would say. What we're targeting are the actual individuals, right? And going back to your question earlier about the traits or the talents that we're looking for. We do also pay attention to making sure that we have at least a few hours of overall between our team members. Not that they need to sort of like have meetings all day long, but team members do need to have collaboration. So we want to make sure that there's some overlap of hours right, uh, within our team members. What are your thoughts on the advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing IT? Interestingly, I think outsourcing has probably given this bad rap, I guess, in the industry. Because it, it sort of like implies that, hey, you're going to ship something out and then you're just going to forget about it. I think as a tech company or maybe any company, but especially a tech company, I don't think we can just simply like, kind of like, oh, you know, I'm just going to ship this tech functions outside and then I'll just forget about it. Because kind of like going back to sort of like this founder mode and understanding the problem that you're solving and how you're solving it with technology, right? You want to really stay close. So I think the key thing there is like making sure that when you're working with a partner in an outsourcing capacity is staying close to them, staying close to the technology, staying close to the product you're building. It's not a relationship where you just kind of like, oh, you know what? I'm going to ask you to do this and then I'm just going to wash my hands off and then come back a couple of months later and hope everything is done. When working with uh, outsourced teams, what are the most efficient and effective ways to ensure alignment with the company's vision? The way we think about it is that we actually don't want to consider whether it's a resources or team members that are coming from our partners or our own FTEs to be any different. The way we think about it, okay, let's have a project meeting. Let's talk about it. Let's not have sort of like this model where, you know, some companies and, you know, have done this in the past where they have like sort of like a single point of interface and then only talk to that one interface, but not talk to everybody. And, and so there's like multiple chains of uh, communication. So I think that the biggest thing is just making sure that same team solving the same problem, make sure everybody truly understands what problem we're solving, right? And let's talk about it together. If there's any issues, run into any issues, then let's bring it up, right? And we'll figure out a way to either compromise or figure out maybe a different way of solving that problem. How do you see the role of IT outsourcing evolving in the context of your industry's future? If you think about where the technology of AI and sort of like this co-pilot is going, I think there's going to be more and more of outcomes-based model, right, in a way. In the past, right, it's been very hard to do that because it takes a long time to develop, you know, a particular product, for example, or a particular feature. I think the, where the technology is moving, it will, I think, shift to an outcomes-based model where companies are going to expect much more about what is sort of like the actual demonstrable output that you're actually producing. Quickly iterate on that until we get to 
to a point where you're actually getting to the outcomes that you're looking for. That's one. And that needs to be powered by having, I think, resources and individuals that are able to use technology that is out there and actually use that to their advantage. It's not so much about sort of like how much lines of code that you're kind of like producing, right? It's about like, hey, you yeah. know, how can you leverage the technology? Are you a technology expert in a way that you can leverage the tools around you to actually generate the outcomes as quickly as possible? As we wrap up our conversation, what advice would you give to companies considering IT outsourcing but concerned about losing control over their technology? I think number one is uh, find the right partner. Whether you lose control or not, I think it's really up to you. It's like if you're concerned about keeping either like the knowledge or the resources, if your partner is willing to work with you, there are ways around that. If you're really concerned about obviously losing touch about sort of like with what's going on or the day to day and how to work together, work with the partner, right? So I think if you find the right partner, there's nothing to worry about, honestly. All right. Thanks for your time. Thanks for joining me today. Great conversation. It was interesting hearing your thoughts about AI, about healthcare. I'm sure my audience will appreciate this podcast. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alec. Really appreciate your opportunity here. If you enjoy our discussion and want to stay updated on future episodes, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you will not miss out on the latest insights and conversations from the Deveco Breakfast Bar. See you in the next episode.